All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Batters. Uh, this is day three of PulpCon 2021. And we're gonna be talking about the sync pipeline. Uh, gonna try to give a little bit of an overview and then go through some of the learnings and challenges that have um, been there kind of along the way. So um, please do inter uh, ask any questions, you know, right as you have them. We'll take some questions at the end too, but um, please just unmute and and ask any questions. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, you can also leave them onto the chat and we'll try to respond there too. So uh, here's the agenda that we're going to look at. Um, I want to kind of motivate why I'm giving this talk a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about what the sync pipeline solves in terms of its uh, needs. I want to talk about some of the design goals for the sync pipeline. I'm going to kind of give a functional overview, look at some customization and usage, share a little bit about the design philosophy, and then we're going to handle some learnings and challenges at the end. So from a motivation perspective, um, the reason I'm giving this talk is because I want to get more people involved. Um, my goal today is to give kind of a, a basic understanding. We're not going to be going through like a whole bunch of code. Um, I want to kind of point out the big parts so that um, I can try to make it a little bit maybe less intimidating or, or less scary to go in there and um, also extend an invitation right up front and again at the end to get involved. And there are a couple people who I feel like understand this code pretty well. Um, I've worked a lot with it. Um, I think Daniel has probably worked you know, as much as I have with it. Um, and there's a few other folks. So um, if you feel like you've worked a good deal with it and um, you can maybe self-identify into the chat um, so that others watching can uh, can know who to talk to like when they want to get involved. But my goal is to get more people involved, um, both using the pipeline and plugins, but also fixing bugs in the pipeline itself, and also um, adding features. I kind of use these terms interchangeably, the stages and the pipeline. Um, the pipeline is made up of a series of stages, as we'll see. So I kind of use those terms uh, interchangeably. So what problems does this um, stages pipeline solve. Um, at, it's used at sync time um, by, I think, pretty much all plugins that do syncing. Um, and here's a bunch of questions that it needs to answer. I'm not going to try to read these, but I'm going to try to anecdotally just contextualize each of these, each of these things. Um, pulp, when it goes to sync, needs to determine if it already has an artifact in um, the artifacts table inside Pulp's database. Um, there's this feature called alternate content sources where when I'm fetching the binary data for a piece of content, and that binary data is called an artifact, I may want to fetch it from a different source. So um, for example, I have like a local copy of, um, of, a, of an RPM repository on like a a local disk. Um, I might want to use that as an alternate content source um, so that, you know, even though I tell Pulp, fetch fetch this, uh, re, you know, EL8 repository from, uh, from the C their CDN, rather than actually streaming all that binary data over the, the WAN, I may want to just use this local disk copy that I have. So that's more or less what the alternate content source feature does. This isn't a talk about alternate content sources but um, it's a detail that needs to be handled. So perhaps, perhaps I want to change the location where I fetch uh, an artifact or binary data from. Or um, how can I download artifacts concurrently? The downloaders are pretty easy, but you know, if all plugins write the same code over and over again, that's not a win for anyone. So we want to be able to download artifacts concurrently. Also, how can we save artifacts efficiently? Um, in, in terms of the database round trip times. We don't want to save them one by one. So we want to make sure to, to kind of go to the database um, a reasonable number of times to make our round trips efficient. Uh, and then it's kind of similar questions for the content side. Um, is this content unit in Pulp's database? Um, 
knowing whether you know I've already got this content unit from a previous sync um, or whether this is a new content unit is key because um, I'm not going to try to um, necessarily create uh, content units if I already have them. And you get duplicate here anyway. So it's important that you that you query to understand if I already have this content in the content table. Like, and content being like, for example, an RPM package or uh, an Ansible collection or something like that, or a file for a pulp file. And also remote artifacts. How can I create remote artifacts? For those who aren't familiar, remote artifacts are um, a model in Pulp's database which define um, the checksums and size and uh, remote URL location um, that can be used to fetch a particular artifact. And this is used for policies like um, on-demand or streaming. Um, those are cases where Pulp creates content units um, because those, those packages or collections, for example, need to be present in Pulp so that they can be advertised to clients correctly, but it's not saving or syncing down the actual binary data. And so when a client, in that case, when a client says, oh, I want to download package 123, um, and, it, and the client like yum, DNF, or pip, or the Ansible Galaxy CLI or something like that, says, oh, I want to download this package. Um, we use this remote artifact data to fetch, um, to know how to fetch on demand the remote binary data. Um, I should point out that uh, in my casual listing of examples, um, Pulp Ansible, which manages collection contents, does not support on demand downloading. So it actually doesn't use remote artifacts here. Um, additionally, how can I have this downloaded content spawn additional work? There are some plugins that need to download binary data, um, analyze it, and then in turn download more binary data, kind of like a like a tree almost. And so we need to be able to support that workflow um, gracefully. And also, how can I ensure that the right content is present in this repository version? Um, Ultimately, when you're syncing something, your, your goal is to download a bunch of content, maybe download a bunch of artifacts, save all that in database, but at the end of all that, you need to create a repository version that has the right content in it. Um, and we tend to use the word association there, so we're associating um, contents and artifacts with uh, that repository version. Any, qu any questions or comments here? This is like a really dense slide. Um, so there are some specific design goals here. I kind of mentioned these, but I wanted to call them out um, kind of intentionally because they really drive the design of the stages pipeline. So we need to minimize the round trips to the database, um, which means that we need to do our work in batches. So when we go to query for content units, we want to query for like, I think the default batch size is 500, 500 content units at a time. Um, or artifacts, do we have you know, these 500 artifacts, it does them in batches of 500. But also at save time too, when we're saving um, content, like new content units, we're gonna save those in batches of 500, for example, or saving artifacts, um, same thing, also batches of 500. So there's this really um, pretty slick batching implementation, which we're not gonna get into like how it works. I think the important thing to know here is that um, batches are important. Uh, it's a, it has to do with round, minimizing round trips to the database. And I'll just point out where in the code the batcher is. Um, all the stages use batching. Um, they all use batching. So we'll see a little bit about how that's used. Um, also, don't wait for all items to finish a step before you start the next step. So for example, um, what we don't want to do is do all the figuring out of what we need to download as we analyze metadata before we start doing downloading. And we don't want to wait for all the downloading to finish before we start associating or saving content units. And we don't want to wait for all that, you know, so on and so forth. So we don't want to have like this notion of phasing. Instead, what we want to do is think of it like a stream um, where as soon as work can be done, it is started. So 
you might, I mean, very realistically, you'll probably be have some of your content units have flown all the way through the pipeline to their final destination where they get associated with the repository version. And other, you know, while the first stage, the head end of the pipeline is still like analyzing um, the metadata and still discovering things to do. So that's generally stream processing. This is one of our bid design goals from pulp two to pulp three. Pulp two systems did not do stream processing. And this is one of the big performance um, architectural limitations, because if you can't do the work quickly, as soon as it's available to be worked on, you're kind of just wasting an opportunity. So this is one of the big differences for pulp two to pulp three. We also want to limit memory usage. Um, this is very important because um, practically speaking for a lot of content types, if you loaded all of the um, objects into memory while you were dealing with them, you would um, be using a lot of memory. Like anecdotally speaking, maybe upwards of 25 gigs, maybe higher than that. And that's, you know, our users don't, don't think that's good. And also it's not, it's not really helpful. Like loading all of it into memory at once is not gonna help you analyze it. Like you don't need to know all the things to do the work for one content unit or for say like 500 content units. Um, so we wanna limit the memory usage. The way that we do that is by, I think it's generally called using back pressure. So the idea is that um, you can only create so many unit, so many content units in memory before the creating of new memory instantiated objects is halted until those existing ones in memory are handled. So the whole pipeline kind of uses this concept of back pressure, and we'll talk about how that's how that's implemented. Um, it's very simple. Uh, so we also need this to be extremely customizable. Um, we want to be able to easily add and remove parts of the pipeline, and we'll look at some examples of that. We also want to easily save objects related to content units. So for example, in RPM, if you're saving an RPM package, you may need to also save its um, associated erratum uh, and its package list and a whole bunch of other models that I'm not very familiar with. But the point is, is that those models have foreign keys typically back to the content unit, which would be an RPM package in this case. So, um, you can't save those other models until the content unit itself is saved. Um, and this is a very common thing. I think maybe half the plugins have custom, have additional models that they're not technically content, but they're models that are designed to store data associated with content. Um, for example, in Pulp Ansible, there's like a docs blob or tags that are additional models that are associated with um, content where the, uh, the content in that case would be a collection, for example. Also, we don't want to rely on ordering of objects being processed. Um, this is an idea that comes up from time to time, like, well, let's just enforce ordering and that'll make this particular problem we're solving easier. We don't want to do that and we haven't done that. Um, and for instance, like, look at the downloading stage. You know, if you're relying on ordering, then downloads finish when they finish. And then all of a sudden we have to wait uh, to pass the one that finished earlier until all the ones ahead of it have finished, that's not efficient. So it's important that we don't rely on ordering. So um, here's a functional overview. Uh, I'm trying to tell a story about like, how does it work from a really big perspective? And then we're gonna look at it just one level down and then we'll look at like a little bit of code, but like how each stage works, I don't think is really that is really that important for my goals here. My goal is to give a kind of a working knowledge enough to go in there and try to try to make something happen. So um, functionally speaking, it's kind of, I think of it as like four parts. Um, there's this first stage, which is declaring artifacts and the content units needed. Um, I use uh, the term declare because it's a declarative API. Um, a plugin provides this first step this is the first, this is the piece that the plugin provides and these other three pieces are provided by pulp core. And uh, the plugin's job here is to declare, I need these artifacts that are associated with these content units. I don't care if they're in pulp already or not. I don't know if they're in pulp already or not. Because if I had to answer that question, I'd be doing the work of the pipeline. 
So let me just declare what I need. Um, and I also don't know or care if this is in the previous repository version. The pipeline needs to handle that. All I know is that I'm saying these artifacts and these content units uh, associated with these content units need to be there at the end. So that's kind of what happens here. Um, and the, that's the plugin's responsibility. And that's the first of these four parts. Then uh, the next thing that happens is artifact handling. So there's like a whole bunch of, not a whole bunch, it's not really that much, but um, there's a few steps for artifact handling. And we'll look at these in detail, but usually it's, um, I want to understand if these artifacts are already present. So again, artifacts are binary data. Um, are they already present in pulp? Um, when, if they're not, and I need to download them, let me download them. Um, if I've downloaded them, let me save them. And that's more or less what the artifact. Oh, and also the alternate content source stuff. Because alternate content source is a feature deals with um, downloading from an alternate content source. And so that kind of falls into the area of artifact handling. Um, there's also then content unit handling. It's kind of similar to the artifact handling, only now for content uh, units. And there's no downloading. Um, so the questions for content unit handling are things like, do I already have this content unit in pulp? And if I don't, let me save it. Um, and I think maybe that's it. But we'll look at these in more detail. So if I'm forgetting one, we'll see. Um, and then at the end, there's create the repository version. Um, and this is what figures out, <clears throat> do I, you know, which of these content units are new and need to be added to the repository version. Um, and also, this is where the mirror, you know, yes or no, true or false is implemented. So if you're mirroring content, um, you will likely also be uh, removing content from the newly created repository version um, in the case where the thing that you're syncing from has content that is missing from the remote that was present in the previous repository version. So um, anyways, this is where the mirroring feature is implemented and we'll see a little bit about that. Um, I mentioned plugins provide the first stage. I wanna talk a little bit about how that happens. Um, so the first stage's job is to parse the metadata that only the plugin code knows how to do. Um, for RPMs, that's the RPM, you know, the repo MD and its associated files. For collections, it's the, and Ansible content, it's the, um, the Ansible Galaxy API. For Python, it's, it's the pip um, simple API. And so every content type knows the APIs and core doesn't. So what the plugin has to do is provide the first stage, which is going to probably download a few metadata files and analyze those files. And what it's looking for is it's trying to, um, well, what it needs to produce, practically speaking, is artifacts that um, are needed and also content units that are needed. And I say that these are unsaved because if first stage were to start trying to save these things, it would not, um, it would be doing the work that the pipeline does because it doesn't know whether these artifacts are new or not, or these content units are new or not. Um, and I'll point out that it's not for these artifacts in particular, it's really specifying what it knows about the artifact and it's not actually downloading the binary data. So it's saying, um, oh, I know it has SHA-256 value of ABCD, um, and I know that I get it from this particular URL, and that's more or less what it what it has for the artifact. And then the pipeline does the rest for the most part. Um, and it organizes these artifacts and content units, these unsaved in memory objects inside of declarative artifacts and declarative content units. Um, and we're gonna look at these here for a minute. So if you're using the pipeline, this is the key, um, these are the key objects that you'll need to make. Um, I'm gonna just show these here. Um, and they're kind of just simple container objects or classes. And then we're gonna look at pulp files use of them. 
So please ask any questions if it's not um, clear. So a declarative artifact um, stores uh, a reference to the artifact. Um, this is the in-memory unsaved artifact, um, which really just contains the, sh the checksum information. Um, because if it contained the binary information, it would be downloading the data, and that's not what first stage in the plugin code is supposed to do. Uh, it also contains the URL. Um, this way, the plugin, the pipeline can perform the downloading. Uh, it also has the relative path. This lets um, Pulp save the content artifact models um, as the pipeline goes. The content artifacts are what say, um, for this repository, this artifact um, is at a particular um, relative path inside of it. So that way, when the content is fetched, it can know, oh, this is the binary data that needs to be served. Um, there's also uh, the remote. The remote is important to know um, which remote to use to perform the fetching, because if the remote is configured with like authentication information or it needs to use a proxy or something like that, um, you specify the remote and those details are handled here. Um, extra data is a way to pass data kind of to yourself. It's not needed by the pipeline, but it's here so that you can stuff data into this, whatever you want into here in first stage, or if you have custom stages, and then you can use that data later. Like one example is, um, this is often where data gets put that's parsed by the metadata and then helps populate these additional models that get saved later um, to be associated with content. Um, so for example, with the, um, the, the pulp um, Ansible plugin, one of these extra data pieces is the docs blob URL. Um, which is where we know to fetch this docs blob and that gets downloaded later. And there's a special stage later that does that. So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit detail. But the point is here is that there's all sorts of plugin specific use cases that make it valuable to be able to pass data, extra data for an artifact. Um, and then this, this deferred downloading, do we need to perform downloading or not? Um, so this is what a declarative artifact object is. Um, and if this is maybe a little bit confusing, but we'll look at the usage here in pulp file here in a moment. So hopefully that'll make it clear. Um, just before we do though, I wanna look at the declarative content. Um, similarly, this uh, content links to an unsaved content unit. It's unsaved because we don't know if pulp has it or not. Um, also, it links to one or more declarative artifacts. And so the objects that we just looked at, the declarative artifacts, they get referenced here. Um, because the idea here is that you're only passing declarative content down the pipeline. Um, the declarative artifacts are passed along with declarative content. Um, and they're, pa they're passed along by virtue of them being stored here. Um, there's another extra data field in case you want to pass extra data. It's the same use case just for um, for content. Um, there's also these items here, future thought queue event and resolved. I don't really want to talk about these in super detail, except that they are all in support of a stage that allows, I mentioned earlier that um, first stage, there are these use cases um, where when you download something, after you've received the binary data, you need to analyze that data. And that binary data itself is actual artifact data. So it needs to be saved and treated just like normal artifact data. Um, but you want to, after it's downloaded, have an opportunity to analyze it so that you can potentially do more downloading. Um, and these are um, internal um, objects that help, you know, they have the underscore here that help support that use case. I don't really want to go into a lot of detail about how, but we will look in the stages listing for um, information about uh, when that occurs. Um, and that's all I want to say about this now. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, so why don't we look at the usage of this in pulp file? Because um, I think it will illustrate well um, what, a, what a first stage looks like. So this is the meaningful part. This is inside of, um, so pulp file is defining a first stage here. It's called the file first stage. 
and it's uh, defining the pipeline and it um, says pipeline, use this first stage. Um, and for the creation of, I wanna focus on the creation of these declarative artifacts and declarative content and also the content and the artifact, which I mentioned were unsaved. So what's happened here is it's downloaded, um, the downloading occurs here and it's downloading for pulp file, it's a single metadata file. So it downloads this one file it opens it up and it begins to iterate through each line in the file. And each line is, an, is a content, uh, is a file content um, instance. And so it says, okay, for the line, let me make the file content. And it parses the relative path. So that's important. Um, that's on the content itself. And then, uh, because that's how, that's how it's modeled in pulp file, not all, um, in fact, I wouldn't even say most plugins do that. So um, anyways, we're, we're making the content and that's what's important. Um, and here's the digest for the content. Um, we're, notice we're not saving it. Um, we're just storing it here as file. So then uh, art, if for artifact, um, we're making, we're storing its size because we have size information and we're storing it SHA-256. But notice we're not saving it or downloading it or doing anything. And then we're saving a declarative artifact. So, um, the, well, no, I'm sorry, we're creating a declarative artifact. So um, this is kind of the container that will store these things that we've made. Um, we store the reference to the unsaved artifact. We know the URL to fetch it from, we store it here. Uh, we know the relative path and uh, we store that here. Uh, we know the remote and we know the status of deferred downloading, whether we need to download it, download the binary data right now or download it um, later. So this will be a true or false value. Um, similarly, for declarative content, uh, we store the reference to the content we created earlier, that's file, and which is unsaved. And uh, declarative artifacts, there's only one artifact backing this piece of content. So it's a list but it stores the single reference to declared artifact. And then this is where it hands off the um, declarative content object, which is the only thing that's passed down the pipeline to, um, to the rest of the pipeline. It calls self.put. Um, all stages and first stages of stage um, have this queue that will pass data to the next stage and self.put will um, basically hand the, the item, which is always declarative content down the pipeline. Um, so that's a lot, that's probably a lot to take in, but um, that is what first stages do. And this is what you'll find in pretty much every plugin that does um, syncing and downloading. So I wanna stop there just to see if there are any questions. In fact, I wanna look back at the, the thing. All right. Um, That's what yeah. I'm surprised here. The declarative artifact and declarative content are not database models. They're just some kind of slave sledge to be able to move through the pipeline. So yeah. Just the character material to say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, they're um, ephemeral containers. They don't have model representations. They're just kind of containers that just get passed down, um, down, down the way. Any other comments or, or questions? All right. Um, so if my goal is to make sure is to make this not intimidating, I think I'm doing a pretty terrible job. I'm just going to say that. Um, uh, all right. That being said, um, here's a fun, here's a here's a nice graphic. This may be better. Um, so this is a, a look at the default pipeline. Pipelines can be customized, but this is a typical default one, default one. Um, and what I've done here is uh, shown all these um, stages. Each This is each a different stage. And these little green boxes are the declarative content units. And these little arrows is a um, async IO queue um, between each of the stages. And so, you know, there's a, there's a step in the construction of the pipeline that assembles the pipeline from some stages. Um, their stages are always linear. There's no branching. This is one of the big early debates in the design. There's definitely no branching. Um, 
So they always run linearly and there's always a queue between them. Um, so if this is a lot to look at, I agree. So why don't we break it down in parts and just focus on the certain portions of it. Uh, first stage all happens here. This is what we just looked at. It builds the declarative artifacts and the declarative content and sends it down the pipeline. Um, so after that, uh, the next thing that happens is all the artifact handling. And I mentioned kind of there's like, I showed this like big block diagram earlier. So this is first stage, this one here. Um, and can you see my pointer, my mouse? I think you can. Yeah, we can see it, Brian. It's small, but okay. yeah, we can see it. All right, great. Um, uh, so then here, this is the second stage. This is the artifact handling. So that's what we're going to look at here. So artifact handling includes querying these existing artifacts, um, which determines, oh, I have an artifact uh, already in pulp or not. And again, artifacts are binary data. Um, and if the artifacts are already in pulp, what this stage does is it, it hydrates you know, in, while it's querying the database to see if these artifacts already exist or not, it's going to, if they do exist, it's going to bring in those representations from the Django ORM and replace the in-memory ones that were created by first stage. Um, so you can think of this as like, do I already have it? And if I do, let me replace its, its um, instance in the declarative artifact. Um, so this does a query and replacement kind of paradigm here. Um, also handle any ACS uh, alternate content source URL remote changes. The alternate content source feature is pretty slick in the sense that um, if, you're, if your plugin uses alternate content sources and there are, are models already, um, the alternate content source data is already saved, um, in that case, you've already synced from the alternate content source, but you've done so in a way that doesn't actually save the binary data. It just saves kind of a working knowledge of what's contained in that alternate content source. And so this stage looks to see, oh, for this declarative artifact that I'm handling, is there already a, a reference known about this in an alternate content source? And if it is, all it does is change the URL and the remote to use. Perhaps you need a different authentication to sync from that alternate content source. So using the different remote is important. But you definitely need to change the URL because otherwise you're not going to get it from the alternate content source. So that's more or less how this stage works. Um, this is only used right now by RPM and file. And if you use pipelines in these other plugins, you actually won't have this stage at all. So. Um, so that's what that does. Uh, next is artifact downloader. So the artifact downloader um, is where the concurrency restriction is provided. And um, it, as efficiently as it can, um, download uh, whatever needs to be downloaded. And it knows if it needs to be downloaded or not because the ones that are already in pulp are already saved. And that, that happens that's important because that happens back here in query existing artifacts. Um, because this stage is before the artifact downloader and it's replaced any artifacts with saved versions versus the unsaved versions, all the artifact downloader needs to do is go, oh, is this thing unsaved? All righty, uh, do I need to download it? Yes, I do. Let me download it. And if it doesn't have to do anything, it just passes it along um, unchanged. So basically, if you were already an artifact is already in the database, by the time it shows up to the artifact downloader, it just gets passed along. So, anyways, a lot of downloading happens here, um, along with re uh, concurrency restriction and stuff like that. Um, the artifact saver is very simple st stage. Uh, it just bulk saves things using bulk inserts. Um, and again, it, it only has to save things that are unsaved. So um, this is benefiting from running after the query existing artifact stage as well. Any questions about that so far? This is like all the artifact handling stuff. Feel free to unmute and ask if there are. 
Um, this part, it has to, it goes from right to left because it was hard to put all this onto a slide. So the next one is um, query existing content units. This is just like the query existing artifact stage, only it's about content units now. So do I already have this content unit in pulp based on its uniqueness constraint? And that's how we can know to search for content. Um, and if I don't have it, then do nothing. Um, if I do have it, then bring in the saved version of the content and replace the reference in declarative content with, uh, with the saved version of the content model. Um, so at exiting this stage, you'll have a mixture of, well, exiting this stage, you'll have 100% saved artifacts because you already did all the artifact stuff and you'll have a mixture of saved and unsaved um, content. Uh, which is a perfect setup to go into the content saver, which performs bulk saving. Again, like bulk saving in batches of 500 because you would want to go to the database a limited number of times. So it's it's efficient to do bulk inserts. Um, and then there's the remote artifact saver. Uh, remote artifacts, like I was mentioning earlier, are um, a memory of, for a particular artifact, what where can I get this artifact later if I need it? Like maybe your artifact got corrupted and you're running the repair utilities. It'll redownload there. Or maybe um, maybe you are downloading with policy equals streamed or policy equals on demand, um, which means that you didn't actually download any data during the artifact downloader because you're just trying to save content units and not actually save the binary data. So um, the remote artifact saver will create all the remote artifacts. I mean, that's the long and short of it. And it does so in an efficient bulk way and determines if they're already present or not. So um, then there's the resolve content features. This is the stage I don't really want to get into detail on, except to say that um, functionally speaking, if you need to download, if you need to analyze saved content after it's downloaded back in first stage and generate new stuff to go down the pipeline, then uh, this, is the, this is the stage for you. <laughs> um, so with that, we'll go to the last two, which are pretty easy to understand. Um, content association handles whether it's mirrors or um, mirror equals true or mirror equals false. And it creates the repository version uh, and performs the association. So in the case where mirror equals false, it's only going to make additive changes because it wouldn't delete anything while adding, while, while syncing things. Um, but in the case where mirror equals true, it will both add and delete possibly. Um, uh, and these are delete, not deleting content definitions or artifacts or anything like that. It's just deleting the association with the repository version that's being created. Um, and then there's end stage. End stage is, is just necessary to handle shutdown. Um, other, you know, we build this pipeline up and then we, it's a coroutine based system. And so we tell the loop, okay, run it till you're done. And so we need to clear identify when it's done. And we can do that when end stage has received all of the, uh, all of the content. So that is um, a look at the, um, a look at the pipeline. So uh, I'm going to look at a little bit of usage in case this is all super confusing. Um, the most basic, uh, we oops, we really need to have usage and customization. This is one of our design goals. So the most basic usage is with declarative version. Um, so declarative version uh, is what you'll use to basically create the pipeline. Um, and this is what defines the generic pipeline that we just looked at. So there's a first stage. So when you use declarative version, you as a plugin writer say, here's my first stage, because that's what you have to provide as a plugin writer. Um, and then this is querying the artifacts. Uh, does this plugin need alternate content sources or not? Um, when you instantiate a declarative version to use the pipeline, you're giving it a first stage, you're going to give it a repository to work on, you're going to say, do I need to mirror or not? And you're also going to say, do I even need alternate content sources or not? Um, so you can see here the pipeline that you get is kind of conditional based on what you need. Um, and then it does the rest of the stages that we already talked about. And 
um, adds the content association stage here, because all pipelines get that, and then adds an end stage here. So the query version is how you is the most basic use of the pipeline. Um, we talked about this, miracles true, false, defaults to false, alternate content sources true, false, defaults to false. Um, you can see pulp files usage of this here. Um, so uh, it's it has file first stage. This is the first stage that the plugin is providing. In this case, pulp file is the plugin. Um, so it's called file first stage, although it could be called whatever. Um, the important part is that that's passed into declarative version. Here's the first argument, along with the repository we're working on, whether we're going to mirror true or false. And um, uh, pulp file does use alternate content sources, so it says true. And then uh, you run the pipeline by saying um, declarative version create. And this call right here is where all the work happens. So from a, from a running top to bottom perspective, your code gets to line 51 and waits a long time, like as long as that sync is running. So that is how pulp file uses it. Um, but a lot of plugins want more customization, so they um, can customize what stages can be included. So I'll give a, a look here at Pulp Ansible's custom pipeline. Um, the way that this, we tried to make this easy by having the stages that is constructed defined in this method called pipeline stages. So when you cust when you subclass a clear version to the to your custom one, you can say, oh, well, I want these stages in the pipeline. And uh, declarative version at when you call the create method will add on the association and the end stage because all pipelines need those. Those aren't optional. Um, but here you can see there's a docs blob downloader stage. And then there's a collection content saver stage. This is a customized um, content saver stage. So anyways, you can have your pipelines use different things by subclassing declarative version and defining pipeline stages. Um, customized content saving. So uh, I meant I showed here like, oh, this is a custom content saver, collection content saver. Well, um, that stage, if we looked at it, um, has, you know, saves additional models. Um, so uh, the content saver stage, this is like an actual look at one of the real stages. So this is the actual content saver stage. Um, which does the querying, do I already have? No, no, it just doesn't even do the querying. That happens in the content querying stage. So it's just literally performing big fancy saving if I need to save it. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's this pre-save and this post-save hook, and it's called with everything in the batch. And um, I want to point out that this is part of the same transaction in Postgres. So when Postgres, uh, goes to save, say, 500 items in the batch. These are content units, like file content unit, or RPM packages, or Ansible collection collections, for example. Um, it's going to open the Postgres transaction. It's going to call pre-save with whatever things you need to do ahead of time. And then it's going to, um, in that same transaction, perform the content uh, unit saving. That all happens up above. And then it's going to call post-save. And this post-save is where a lot of plugins have a whole bunch of additional models saved. And so this is another one of the main customization points. Uh, oh, yeah, Paul Bansible does it here. Oh, yeah, this is what I was showing earlier. So the collection content unit saver implements a pre-save and it implements a post-save. And it does like additional extra work that needs to happen here so at content unit saving time as part of the same transaction. Um, okay, so um, this is that's kind of enough of like the details, really. Um, I know there are many. Uh, so the design philosophy here is that every stage has one concern, um, and what we're trying to do here is construct the pipeline that you want and avoid these large if conditions. A lot of these if conditions are not just like simple if checks in memory; they have to check against like the database, like. Look at alternate content sources. If you need alternate content sources, you have to run these 
pretty significant, I would say very significant queries actually against the database for every piece of content, which you're doing in batches, but still like if you just don't even run those queries, that's a huge performance win. So the idea here is that you construct the pipeline that you want and just let it run and you don't try to, you know, feature flip on and off um, at runtime. Uh, you kind of do this. Um, and one idea here, as I was making this presentation, I realized that we we could be disincluding the artifact downloader and the artifact saver stages for the non-immediate policies. And this is a, kind of a, a not yet application of one of the core design principles. So we should go do that. Um, the credit for this goes to uh, a non-Red Hat contributor, a wonderful person named um, Simon uh, GMB Nomis, who I would say made the core of this design. And this is really his design philosophy that I've tried to steward and shepherd um, as he's gone on to focus on kind of other projects. So the learnings portion of this, um, I would say we could not have done this without external public collaborators. I mean, 100%, we couldn't have done this without um, a variety of people who are external to the core team, Red Hat, et cetera. Um, whether it was contributing use cases actual proof of concepts, discussion, critique, concern. I mean, there we had to do this with publicly and with transparency or we absolutely would not have ended up here. Um, also, coroutines are a great technology for this. They let us um, kind of run this like highly in, it's not technically in parallel, but it is efficiently asynchronous, um, particularly as the kernel can do work um, underneath while the Python process can continue to do other work, um, particularly with the case of things like downloading, for example. Um, but coroutines are a great technology for this because they let us write the code as if it's running synchronously, but then kind of run it asynchronously. So it's just a great fit. Um, this was the third time that we've tried to build something like this. And I think this is true for a lot of things. Um, big, when you have really complicated requirements, it just ends up this way. In Pulp 2, we have this thing called the step system for anyone having uh, feelings on that. Um, also, we had chain sets as another kind of alternative implementation in Pulp 3. It was an early proof of concept. Um, and so this is the third evolution. So one thing I've learned is that if you want to build something, you're probably going to build it over and over a few times, which may sound not great, but that's I think that's pretty realistic. Um, I, I think it's been very successful. There's been almost no redesign in 24 to 36 months. It's used by all plugins that sync things 100%. And it's a large source of the speed up, primarily due to the efficient batching, but also the efficient stream processing. Um, in the challenges section, uh, there's a few things that are hard about this design. Harder supporting the total number of items is hard, and this is due to stream processing. So. Um, you don't know the total number of items to report progress until you've processed all the items. Um, and so uh, because of the back pressure, which I didn't actually explain, I realize now, um, but I'll do that quickly in a second here. But because of the back pressure, first stage gets halted while it's playing it now. So the way the back pressure works is these queues in between the stages, the ones that I mentioned up here, they're only 100 items large. So you can only store 100 items here, 100 items here, 100 items here. So when this has 500 items in it, and this has 100, and this has 100, 500, 100, 500, 100, 500, that adds up to like, I don't know, like 6,000 items. Um, you know, if this has 100 items in it, the pipeline would be full at this point. If this has 100 items in it, first stage can't put a single more item in here. And when it goes to issue that put that we saw back in the pulp file implementation, it just waits there. And the coroutine is considered blocked until the put can be completed. That put's not completed until a pull of those items off of the queue occurs here. And that won't occur unless this one can be done, so on and so forth. So this is kind of a count-based back pressure system. Brian, can I do a quick time check with you if that's OK? Yeah, I mean, I'm, my goal is to finish up in t under two minutes. Um, yep. Uh, so the memory, so this is hard because, you know, first stage can practically speaking get halted 
Um, and so it can't re continue processing the total number of items until right at the end when almost everything's been done. And so reporting progress, practically speaking, is just really difficult. I don't see a solution to it. It's the downside of having an efficient stream, stream processing system. Um, because if we counted all the things up front, then we wouldn't be doing stream processing. Uh, the memory limiting could, could be better. In fact, Daniel and I were brainstorming this idea that instead of doing back pressure by count, we could actually do it by total process memory size, which would be a really slick feature to allow um, the pipeline to self-govern the amount of memory used based on how big things are. In some cases in RPM, a single RPM in memory can be really significant. So by doing this by count, it's just not a great method. We can make this much better. Um, it's difficult to write queries that we need efficiently. If you actually go look at the code and the stages, it's complicated. Um, you have to do a lot of batches. You have to do a lot of subqueries. It's just, it's hard. Um, but uh, it seems to mostly be in place. So if you want to learn more about really advanced query stuff, go look in there. Um, it doesn't handle publication creation or metadata mirroring well. You can read this ticket, 8687. Um, thanks to Daniel for bringing up these concerns. I agree with him. Um, it would be nice if the pipeline could be extended so that if you need publication work done at the end of it, the pipeline could just handle that for you. Um, or if you need metadata mirroring, the pipeline could just handle that for you. Um, and one challenge is it seems complicated. Um, and that's probably because it is. But the irony is that it's not nearly as complicated if you had to solve all these problems on your own as a plugin each every time. Uh, where's my screen? OK. Wow, Thank I feel like I just, just ran a marathon. My apologies. You did. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I see that uh, our, yeah, um, Tanya has a question, I suppose. Just our, our friends from Kong, I see, are arriving. So I just want to welcome them. And um, just if we can finish up relatively fast just to respect their how would you say their um uh, time. what's the word yeah time, time. um just, yeah tanya please tanya do you have a brief question otherwise what we can do is continue this discussion on um pulp dev if that's helpful um i have a brief comment actually that's it. perfect um so for for plugin writers or so just wanted to mention that uh, in 90% of the cases, we use the Stages API for, for the sync, but sometimes you need to have different tasks and you can become creative. And we also use these Stages API for the migration from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3. Just wanted to uh, highlight that it's not very often that you might need it, but there could be some other cases outside of sync when you care about going through artifacts content um, and yeah. check. In the OS3 plugin, it's used for the uploads also because there's uh, a lot of things being uploaded and you want to process them just like you do with syncing. Cool. That's wonderful. Um, so this talk is designed to get people involved. Um, so if you want to get involved and you even didn't understand a word I said, but you still want to get involved, that's great. Come talk to me. Come talk to Daniel. Tanya, I know, I know knows a lot about it. Matias knows a lot about it. And um, uh, welcome to the conflicts. Um, I yield my time. Thank you very much. I'll just stop the recording to keep things clean.